together as we sing to God. Let's really praise Him right now. I see the sky. Richard Turner, thanks so much for coming on to talk with Lee. So I'm witness in the Northwest England, not far from Liverpool. Now, today we're going to be talking about your time a few years ago in a Pentecostal cult. And for reasons of confidentiality, we're not going to name this particular church, but we will reveal that it also ran a charity supporting survivors of human trafficking. Uh, but before we start, uh, let's just hear a little bit uh, about your background. Uh, okay, yeah. Um... Obviously, I'm from, from Witness, which is near Liverpool. I, I grew up here. Um, I am a, a trained counsellor, um, and I studied a master's in the psychology of controlling behaviour. After doing my counselling training, I trained as a teacher, specialising in teaching counselling. And for the last few years, I've been working part-time teaching counselling whilst doing my master's, and I'm currently about to uh, go into full, full-time work, working as a counselling lecturer alongside my private practice counselling. Um, uh, business, if you like, uh, which specialises in helping ex-cult members and delivering cults awareness training. Excellent. Now, this is quite a detailed and bizarre story. So I think the best place to start is a few years ago when, mm -hmm. as a student therapist, you were looking for a placement. Now, yeah. you did some volunteer work at first, but then you heard about this particular charity attached to a church. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's pick up the story from there. Well, whilst doing my counselling training, I'd been doing some fundraising for an organisation called the A21 campaign, raising money for victims of human trafficking. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if I could look for a counselling placement working with people who've been trafficked? Because that was my passion. Uh, so I looked around and found this local charity, um, and I um, contacted them saying, "I'm looking for a counselling placement. Do you have any opportunities?" I met up with one of the managers for coffee. And it turned out they didn't really have any counsellors um, at the moment, but they offered me um, a chance to do a little bit of volunteering working in the safe houses with, with, with people who had been trafficked. Mm -hmm. So um, I, 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 I did a few days volunteering. It was only basic things, take someone to a doctor's appointment, help out with some um, practical issues in the house, do a bit of tidying up. Then um, I was invited out for the Christmas meal and the manager went over saying, so would you like, would you like a job? And that was how I got employed in them. Um, so they offered me work as a support worker at first. Uh, I did that for a while. And whilst I was doing that, I was also working for the United Reformed Church, which is a, like a more mainstream Christian denomination as a youth worker. Um, so I did, I did the two jobs at the same time whilst doing, finishing off my counselling training and looking for another placement because they didn't offer one. Um, and over time, uh, so after, after a while, my, my, um, my employment ended with the United Reformed Church because it was the end of my contract. And then so I left that church as a congregation mm -hmm. member as well and joined the, the congregation um, associated with the charity. So at that point then, I, I ended up working for them, um, and it went up to 32 hours a week because uh, I was also promoted to work to, um, to oversee the running of a safe house as well as do the casework, and I was also attending the meetings. So that's how I slowly got drawn into it. Um, first, it was just a volunteering, then it was a job, and then I started attending the meetings, and that was over about a period of a year and a half, I think. I noticed something like was a little bit odd about them, but I just kind of like justified it and thought, well, you know, no one's perfect. This is a bit strange. There are a few things that didn't really add up about it. But um, I went on to, to so so 
a certain point, probably around July, a few year, a number of years back, I went um, to the headquarters for a chef, for a training event, um, and that that was in a different city to where I lived, and that was when it was it was a little bit strange because somebody got somebody got up, and the the it was more like. Um, uh, evangelistic even though a lot mm. of the staff weren't anything to do with the church or anything or the call and it was more like it was like 50 percent training 50 percent a little bit kind of like recruitment evangelistic type thing and it mm. it was a little bit uncomfortable it was a bit odd um and i think at that point that's when things started to turn the turning point was probably that training weekend when um i got i i, I met someone and um and, and and like in a, in a romantic sense, met someone, and that was that was the thing when things started to change and evolve into something much more sinister. I think. So you had this placement at the church's charity, but we're now attending the meetings at the church mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't long before you made friends, and in particular, like you said, a girlfriend. She had been in the church a few years and seemed a little bit indoctrinated, mm -hmm. and that's really when things got uh, even more odd. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. I think things. I mean, they were looking back, the warning signs leading up into this, but the kind of like justification to to deal with the discomfort of the oddness um, kicked in, and I just got used to the oddness over time. So, so even in the very first service I attended before I even met um, this girl, there was a sermon about how how the church wasn't controlling, um, you know, and I remember thinking, oh, that's a bit strange because. Um, why would you have to say that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why, why would you have to say that, 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 that? Why would you have to? It was almost like someone had challenged it and he thought we better like mention this in the service. Yeah. And and there were lots of issues to do with money. They were asking for lots of money and things like that. So they oh, were, yeah. so some of the, some of, like I said before, there were some like weird things that didn't really add up. And you know, um, like almost almost like a str strange 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 behavior in the people as well. Like the, the way they, the way they spoke about the church felt quite artificial. Like it wasn't. Like mm. the real opinions, things like that. So I met I met this this person. Um, we went out on our, our first date, but even then that was a little bit odd because the person I was heard was talking about how they weren't allowed to keep secrets from people in the leadership and how they how they controlled everything. Um, no, sorry, sorry, the, 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 sorry. I should clarify. The person had been a client five years pr uh, previously in in the charity, but but not a trafficking victim. Um, and they were talking about how they controlled them when they when they were a client when they were, were part of the charity, um, and it sounded to me and it's again it's another one of those warning signs that are dismissed. But like the control was still a little, little bit there, so mm. so they said they weren't allowed to like keep secrets and the leadership. But even even then though, when I started to to date this person, my line manager so so my line manager was was a worship pastor in 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 the in the cult. Um, he was he was you know involved with the music. He led one of the midweek groups as well as my line manager. So when I started to date her, I got called into the office, and it was almost like I mean I, I, the craziness of it now it, it it makes me laugh because no line manager in any company would be calling a staff member in for a meeting about their romantic life. Um, <laughs> but he did. He called me in. He said um, and gave me a talk basically, and that was when I started to realise that. There was a controlling entity behind the relationship, and which I would call the leadership, if you like. Um, he said, "You you need to learn to submit to the leadership. You need to to learn to obey whatever they say without question." Um, he gave me a load of ground rules for the relationship. I wasn't allowed to kiss her. I wasn't allowed to sleep in the same building as her. If I went to visit her because she lived in this other city, I had to stay with people from the group. I wasn't allowed to go to a house, stay at a house. And things like that, and it was made clear to me from the beginning, like, oh, there's there's another element to this relationship. It isn't you and her? It's there are these people behind, and we're controlling it. And that from the beginning set like a like set up like an uncomfortable feeling. Like if I do anything wrong here, they're they're gonna take it all from me. And like it, I felt like powerlessness right from the very beginning. But even as the relationship progressed. There were strange things that happened. So, like, I went to visit her. She stayed in her friend's house. I stayed in her house. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, 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 at church the next week, I found out that the, the someone had found out I'd been in her house, even though she wasn't there. She was sleeping somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And and they'd rang up the other city. who would rang up the other leaders, and they'd all checked where I'd slept. So oh. just for a bit of context, um, I was 32 at this point. She was 29 years old. And they were ringing each other, people who I didn't even know, leadership, checking where we were sleeping. Um, and there was another instance where, you know, we were 
hypothetically talking about engagement and things like that. And, and, and she'd been told that I wasn't allowed to choose how I proposed to her. I had to go to the, 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 these w- women who were in, the, in leadership and trust positions of trust within the, the group, and they will tell me how to propose. So the example she gave was, you might decide to take me to Paris and I don't want to go to Paris, so you need to go to the leadership and they'll tell, tell you what to do because you don't know me. And it was a strange flip in her personality. So she was this one person. And then as soon as she started talking like about this, it's like a, a personality changed. And it was really bizarre. It was like she's reading from a script that she'd been taught. Um, and and that, that over time, I was only with her for four months, but over the time, it, there was a real sense of not none of this is about like, like we've been watched all the time you know this this is gonna this is this isn't it's gonna crumble and i was struggling with that because i looked around in a grief and i didn't trust anybody mm-hmm. um and um you know I, I didn't well to give you an example about the trust thing i knew someone so what they used to mm-hmm. do is assign accountability partners and it appeared to me that the, my line manager had, de- had been told or had decided to become my accountability partner without my even agreeing to it. Um, and I, I knew someone else who was somebody else's accountability partner for their relationship because that's what they did, a set accountability partners for relationships, which is just control, really. And he would gossip about me with the, this other person's relationship, and I started to realise and notice things where there was a culture of gossip. There's no secrecy. E- everything's reported back. And and you can't really trust any uh, anyone. So um, in the end, in a nutshell, obviously you can't you can't function in a, in a relationship where you feel like you're wondering if your partner's reporting everything back to the leadership. You don't know. No. You can voice your concerns, you know. Um, and it crumbled because I crumbled because I, I was looking around for who was talking about the struggle, and there was just there wasn't no one. And it's not any the trusting it was an immaturity in in the in the members of the group it was like i don't trust these people with with this because i don't think the yeah. uh they don't seem to be able to grasp the situation um in a nutshell we ended up breaking up uh, i i would say i just i just couldn't hack it um there were there, were, there was a couple of days where we, we were we fell out of a few things and one of them was a reporting back to people things that were going on with us um and basically it ended up where we we broke up i told my line manager he said oh don't worry it'll be all right you'll sort it out and then a few days later i was called in to go for coffee with him and and like ordered basically not not to ever contact her again he said you, you, you you'll never contact her again um never talk about her never pray for her um you need to learn to submit to the leadership you need to do exactly what they say and and learn to um, to to trust their wisdom. I got, I got the big speech again about submission, um, and it was quite obvious and it was quite clear to me that, that this had this had been an order, and, and I was they decided that they didn't want us together. And then this particular line manager, who I felt had been really been grooming me from the beginning, because he was like, "Oh, you're amazing. You're doing a great job." And then he'd slip in a load of manipulation, and then it was like a prey sandwich, but in the middle of it wasn't yeah. constructive feedback; it was manipulation. <laughs> Um, I used to do that to me all the time, but um, he told me that they'd done it to him and they'd ordered mm-hmm. him not to have contact with an ex-partner and move on, and that's what had happened. But that's when I started thinking, who's broke this up? What's really going on here? Um, two people in the group had told me on two different occasions that uh, what one of them had told me that the leadership had said that they're not going to let her get into another relationship again, um, and, the, and she'd warned my ex-girlfriend not to listen to these certain people because they didn't know me and they didn't know what was going on. And another person um, had, had jokingly said, "Oh, it's it's really sad, really, because the control in it." And I, it's it's quite textbook, really, from what I've read about other cult type groups, where they're that disconnected from reality. If you don't realise how shocking some things are that, that are going on, it was dismissed as a joke that someone's life was being controlled. Um, and for me, hearing that, I was like, "This this is this isn't funny. It's not something to be laughed off. It's serious." Um, anyway. A while passed, I sent her a bunch of letters because I actually then really did believe that someone was controlling her. Um, I heard nothing back. Further down the line, um, I got a letter which had the group's um, postal stamp on it. So it was sent from their offices, not from a private like post, post box. It had somebody else's, else's handwriting on the envelope. My name was misspelt. Clearly hadn't been written by my ex-girlfriend because I checked it against cards and letters I had from her. Mm-hmm. 
and um, it basically it was typed as well, so there was nothing on it to say that she'd written it. And it said, um, I'm fully accountable to the leadership in my world. You need to become accountable to the mm. leadership. Told me to become accountable to the, to the pastors and um, that she never wanted to see me again. And it, it was in language that she didn't even really use. Um, and, and then in a nutshell, I, I, I started to just like break down because what was happening is I was, the, the, behind the scenes of that, the line manager was meeting with me every week. And like every time I would talk about it, he'd just cut across me, he'd ignore me, sure. he'd put pressure on me to get more involved in the group. Um, and I, I was so messed up in my mind. I was like, if, 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 I, if I become more dedicated, they'll give her back to me. Like I knew it was wrong, but it was like I was trying to play some game. But my mind was that confused. Um, I, I, I actually became more dedicated. So I gave them more money. I moved in with people from the group, which I later found out they were overcharging me for the for the for the rent. Um, so so at that point, I was getting paid a low wage by the the, the cult charity. I was being overcharged for my rent by somebody in the group because I was and I was living with them, um, and I was given more money to 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 demonstrate my commitment. And on one occasion, uh, one month, I was even asked to take a ten percent pay cut because the charity didn't have any money. So I said yes, and I give them ten percent as well as the ten percent I was giving on top, um, and I just like it, it totally played with my mind because what happened was I was being met with my line manager every week for coffee and under the banner of "I'll support you through this," but I was being coerced into getting more involved in the group. And every mm. time I wanted to talk about what was going on with her, it would cut across it, it would ignore it. But then when I think they must have found out I was sending her letters, one day it just stopped talking to me. Hmm. And his wife, who who I was friends with, stopped talking to me. And I started attending the meetings, and everyone suddenly started to stop talking to me. So, um, so so yeah, I I, I mean, lots of th things went on w within that. But in me, basically, I was just having a breakdown because I was being treated like I was passive aggressively, like a criminal, um, like I'd done something horrendously wrong, um, and I, it wasn't adding up because intellectually and factually i knew something was wrong in this situ situation some people were saying to me oh, this isn't right this is wrong but but the way i was being treated was 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 that, that i was the problem and that did me a lot of damage like um mental health wise um and about eventually i just had a breakdown really um, and and went off sick um went back in for a few weeks went off sick again and then and then and then left but um I was so frightened of them when I left. Like, I really thought I was losing my mind, like I was a terrible person. I was I was frightened of handing in my notice. I stayed off on the sick for months because I was so irrationally now looking back, but I was so frightened of them. I was scared of even handing in my notice. And even when I did report that, that I had concerns about this particular line manager, um, it was I got like one sentence, two sentences back from the director saying, well, you could have told us this when you were here. And they just dismissed it. Um, I later found out many people had the same problems, but I didn't know who to trust. And I didn't know other people were getting mistreated who were working for the charity at the same time. But I estimate about 12 people resigned over the course of a year and a half because of mistreatment, bullying from this particular line manager, um, which, you know, for me is only really a reflection of what the group was like. Wow. Um, and you experienced avoidance and even shunning from this church, didn't you? Uh, yeah, it's quite an interesting one because I know different kind of court groups shun in different ways, and sometimes it's very direct, and there's no there's no confusion about what's been done because people actively will verbally shun people. Mm. But my group had a very passive aggressive culture. Nothing was you, they were very careful about what they put in writing. It was very difficult to get them anything on anything, and there was there was this sense that the shunning was done very passive aggressively. People would just stop talking to you and you didn't really know why. And there was a time when I would literally attend a meeting and not one person would speak to me. And I didn't know why. And I'd go. And, there was, and people would speak to me, as it, but they were awkward. Like, like they thought I was hiding something. Or do you know when someone's got an issue with you, but they don't want to mm. say it and they're trying to act nice. And it was like that. It was like there was this unspoken thing. But, but there isn't a shunning me, policy per se, is it? Like Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't say um, we have a shunning I, policy. They just they just did it. Well, from my, I've heard from other members that were there longer, were perhaps involved in different ways. That there were kind of like, um, don't don't talk to them anymore. 
don't you know don't have interaction with them and i know someone in it who was told not to have any contact with them or many more oh, um and i like an unwritten that, rule yeah it's like it was like an unwritten rule but it was talked about off the record um so she, she you know and, and i would get asked questions like oh you know for example is this, is this person good for you that you're hanging around to do you were talking to or um you know another thing they do it was like they, they would do I, I suspect and I feel that it, there was constructed dismissal in the workplace as well. So, mm. like, um, they, they make they start taking away responsibility from your job to try and push you out, um, tweaking your job role. So I went on holiday and I came back, and 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 it, there was an email saying that this person had been given this job and the job title was my job title, and I confronted them, and I said, "Well, what's going on here? Because this isn't that's my job title," and I, and I pretended they forgot what my job role was. And it was like that, and you just thought it was just it was exhausting. <laughs> uh, I know other people right. who, who who had responsibilities taken away from them. People where they found reasons to 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 get rid of certain staff members, but everything was done so it looked like it was by the book or like they tweak. It was clever. Mm. It was really clever, really passive aggressive and clever. So you couldn't get any. It was like you 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 knew what was going on. It was obvious, but the, it was plausible. Pl well, it was plausible. Um, and that's what's really difficult because um, it may as well. It just makes you feel like there's something wrong with you. Nobody likes you, you know. I had a friend who who I was confiding in, who wasn't part of the cult but just worked for them, and I would share things with him um, and, and share what was going on. And we we went for lunch a few times, uh, and he said to me that this line manager is part of the cult. Is, is 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 asking who I'm, who we're meeting for lunch and what we're talking about, and because he was digging for information about me. Um, and then suspiciously, he was sacked the next week after my friend refused to tell him. Um, and and it was it all looked plausible because they said, oh, well, you weren't doing your job properly. But I know my, my friend was um, not trained properly. And I know that he was asking for help, saying, I've not had this training, I need to know. And he wasn't doing it. And they used that as a legitimate reason to get rid of him. But it was of their own creation. And that was the kind of thing that they used to do. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't like you. They just... It was made. You you knew you weren't going anywhere in the charity, and you knew that, that it wasn't going to work out. Um, yeah, and 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 just along those lines, the avoidance, the shunning kind of thing. What they did used to do, and this is another example of how passive aggressive it was. They do a sermon about um, specific issues that was like suspiciously close to things that things that affected you. And it was quite clear from the front that they were talking about you because they could get like quite a little bit nasty about it. Um, and there was one when all of this was going on with my ex-girlfriend where the pastor stood up and, and was talking about these men who were horrible and, and the Muppets and it got really nasty and the Muppets like that. And like you, you knew it's about you, but if you'd have challenged it, they just said, no, no, we were just talking generally about things. And it was like that. You couldn't ever really... but. It, that it, it, invo it invoked this sense of shame in you yeah, because everyone in the in the meetings is going hallelujah amen amen reinforcing this mm. quite nasty behavior from the front and making you feel even worse like there's something wrong with you so um yeah sh there was a shunning but i would say it was a little bit off the record it was never so much it, it was always what i always felt like about my group is it was mild. It was milder from the pulpit, if you like, from the front, and more forceful in secrecy. So, if anyone visited, it didn't look as bad, and it seemed to be be able to justify it. But it's and in secrecy, it was very coercive. Um, um, and and just to give you another another kind of example about that and how that kind of worked, there was one sermon about how when children are about to run into danger, you need to step in and stop them because they're in danger. And, and you need to say, no, stop. And that, that's that's what the pastors were doing in church. But very certainly what they're really saying is there is you're a child and you can't make decisions for yourself, even if you're an adult. So we have to step mm -hmm. in and stop. Yeah. So it seemed like it was quite logical. Oh, yeah, you, you do want to stop children getting into danger. But what they're really saying is that's how they viewed those as little children who couldn't make any decisions. So everything was very, you know, passive aggressive. Yeah. After all this stress and doubt, mm -hmm. you decided you had to leave. And you did this simply by uh, submitting a sick note, didn't you? Yeah. Well, it was a long period of le le probably about six months of a leaving process. Um, first, 
Um, I, I come back from my holiday, found out that, that strange story of the guy seemingly being given my job whilst I was on holiday. I went off sick straight away. Uh, I was off sick for, for, for I think, about a month, six weeks. Um, and I thought, I'm going to come back. And on my return to work with you, I'm going to tell them everything. But that was that was from a work point of view. But, but alongside that, I'd visited um, an Anglican church, a Church of England church, and I told them what was going on. Um, and basically the vicar said, you're in a cult, you need to get out and not go back. And it was as blunt as that. And I happened to visit their church one Sunday and their whole sermon that Sunday I visited was about how controlling behavior is wrong. And it was about cults. <laughs> um, so that, that was what prompted me leaving the meetings, leaving the organization as an employee. I say I handed in the signal. I went off for a few weeks. Then I, then I went back because you see, what, what trapped me in it a lot was, if I left, they had no money. Um, you know, I, mo- I moved home as soon as I left the group. So, um, so literally one one day, I told the guy, "I'm not living here anymore," um, and I left immediately. And then let, went off on the sick um, and left around the same time. But um, mm. I went I went back because because I didn't know what to do. Like I needed a job. I didn't have any income. You know, I, I was kind of like trapped in it in some ways from a financial point of view. But I went back for a few weeks and. On my return to work interview, I said everything, and then, but this was so that so that so at the time, my line manager changed to someone, um, and it was him I told, and this other lady, and they were both heavily involved in the cult as well, and and what what they did, they were like a nice polite buffer, um, but they were still gaslighting me, they were still trying to convince me as imagining things. So I told them about the relationship, I told them what the line manager said, but then they plant the fear and that's a very serious accusation you're making. You yeah. know, these things are very serious, what you're saying. And I like panicked and like retracted it and edited it out of the notes when it, when I was going to sign it. Um, and what they kept doing as well was I was saying that I had concerns about my ex-girlfriend being control, controlled. And I said that this feels like it's a safeguarding issue because I don't know how much control these people have got over life. And what they would do is quick, keep switching it back to me, not, you know, me wanting a back. I was like, no, this isn't to do with the relationship. But this is to do with the fact that I'm concerned about their well-being. It's not me trying to get them back. Mm. And they kept going back, and they would just ignore what I was saying. And they, and then they said, oh, well, we'll, we'll try and talk to her. We'll, we'll get in contact with with the organisation in the other city, and we'll, and we'll, and we'll, um, the other, the other office, if you like, in the other city, and we'll, and we'll see if she wants to talk to you. Anyway, they come back and they said, oh no, she doesn't want to talk to you. And I was a bit like, yeah, but that's not the point. The point, the point is, she's mm. being controlled. So. He kept switching it all the time to make it look like it was me that wasn't let go of the relationship rather than the other issue, which is that, that there was someone being controlled. Um, and the problem is that they, they were so indoctrinated in the group and they they believed that the leaders were wise and they'd go on about them all the time, about their wisdom. And um, they, they, they couldn't they just couldn't see it. So a few weeks later, I went off sick again. And, and that's when that struggle came in and mentioned uh, were. I was so frightened I couldn't hand in that last I couldn't sorry I couldn't hand in that um resignation email so uh, so for for a month I just held back and held back and and I was getting me sick pay and I, and um and and handed it in with a complaint and it, nothing was really done about it and I moved on but I was frightened to hand in my resignation mm. I was that a mess in my mind they really they really um scram, scrambled with with my perception um, because because of the way because of the way I was treated. I mean, you know, have you have seen to be challenging anything or criticizing anything in the charity or in the, in the cult or in the church? Then you're you're if they can't correct you, you're you're right off straight away. So, and about a year after leaving, there was a uh, a news report that came out about this charity. So, uh, can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, that 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 was. Um, I mean. <laughs> Like I wanted validation for my own experience, but I never thought that I'd be looking on national TV and there it was on the news. Um, however, yes, they were on the news because some ex-clients had gone to oh, a reporter and told them their stories. Um, and so, and I, and and so, so I switched. So I played this news report, and um, I, the, the weight that lifted off my shoulders because someone else had experienced something negative. Because it was there in the public eye was huge. It was absolutely. It was one of the most healing experiences I've had mm. in a short period of time. Um, I've, never, I've never experienced that. But 
Um, that was that was amazing, really. I, I went to Sheffield and I met with lots of people from the news report. Some of them were ex-staff, some of them were ex-clients, some of them were were ex-members of the the cult as well. Um, and heard all sorts of horrendous stories. Sadly, which didn't end up getting featured on, on the news report and didn't get and it didn't end up getting followed up because of the. I think it was the time the Cambridge Analytica story was really big, and it was, it was the, you know, the new, you know, it's such a big story. They couldn't fit in; they didn't have the time to fit the other stuff in. But I heard all sorts of strange, uh, you know, horrendous things like uh, to do to do with the way people have been treated and uh, manipulated. And and, what, and I, I think one of the most alarming things I heard was, and I, and I saw saw the, the the client notes of this, and I saw the. Um, the itinerary and that the, the, they went through, um, and I also did did a bit of background on this myself. And that some of them were getting cancelled by uh, somebody who had no qualifications in counselling, which is which is really frightening mm. um, to me because I'm a counsellor and I, I know, you know, when people have been through serious drama, that that that's hor- it's horrendous to me. But um, that 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 was a key point because we we set up a support group online after that and there were 60 people in it within three days telling all sharing all sorts of stories but and that was really important sadly though um you know i the the charity commission um wanted some form of investigation and so um sadly though um they 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 got an independent investigator and it turned out the investigator knew the trustees and everyone was too frightened of speaking to them so 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 he, did, he wasn't even able to interview people in response to that, um, and I, a lot of people and I and I agree felt it was a bit of a whitewash, um, and I know that a lot of things I said weren't even included in in this mm-hmm. final report, and I just felt uh, well it doesn't surprise me because that was the culture of the group really, um, but yeah yeah um, so so that yeah that news report was really big it's not been followed up since but I have had um, contact with journalists over the last year. I don't really know what's going to happen in the future with that one, though. Richard, that was a really wild and bizarre story. And it seems that controlling cults are all around us and not often easily detectable. But before we go, we should mention that after leaving, you were diagnosed with autism and uh, that Mm. this has a certain relevance to your story. Yeah. So obviously, you know, your identity has been like so negatively impacted by a cult group because of control, manipulation, coercion. And um, obviously you, you start questioning who you are, what you're about. You go into your past, you think, how did I get here? Is there something about me? And and, and part of that journey was actually um, chasing the diagnosis, um, you know, for, for autism. At the beginning of that really was the, the, the quite well-known Chris Packham documentary on Asperger's. And that was... That was a moment when I kind of, kind of realised that oh yeah I, I probably am autistic and uh, they don't diagnose it as Asperger's anymore it's just called an autistic spectrum condition but after reading about that I realised that um, that I was pr- probably on the spectrum but that that diagnosis kind of helped me realise you know that that perhaps I was slightly more vulnerable to that coercion and I started to wonder could they see that in me like could they get away with more because when I told other people in the group what was happening they were shocked. And I know that, you know, you, not everybody has an, um, a really um, intense experience in a cult. Some, you know, that some people know how much they can get away with with certain people and other people never find out that this manipulation or abuse is going on. So I felt a little bit like my my my, my autistic traits perhaps made me more vulnerable because I was more trusting. Mm-hmm. Um, but also perhaps made me, um, enabled me to get out quicker because, you know, I don't like injustice. I can't cope with it very well. Um, I, I speak my mind quite often, and people don't often like that, and especially cults don't like that. I think that's perhaps the reason why I got sucked in quickly, but got pushed out quickly as well, because I I can't let go of an injustice. I can't just let things slide, um, and 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 that is quite common for people on the spectrum as well. So uh, it's been, it's been an important diagnosis for that for me, and as well, I think it has been important to. To kind of to, to kind of celebrate the fact that I've come through that, come out the other side, and yeah. and got this 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 you know, um, I don't want to say disability, but there was there is part of me that, that you know things that th- things have been quite challenging in my life because of that. You know, experiencing bullying in school and things like that. But I mean, the other thing I just want to mention on that as well is 
often people on the spectrum st- do struggle with bullying, especially in, in school. And, you know, you come out of school and you, you, you perhaps got low self-esteem and then someone's love bombing you and going, you're amazing, you're great. And in my group, I'd be in tears because no one had ever said all these great things about me. But unfortunately, now I realise that was like a currency to buy me. Um, and so um, and that's another aspect, I think, that made me weak. But it's also now, you know, autistic people have special interests and minds, cults and learning about it and understanding the psychology. Um, and I think that's actually now now has, has been a benefit. So it's got it's got strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Well, the irony of this story is that you were involved with a charity set up to give support to victims of human trafficking. But the charity was linked to a cult that was, in your experience, uh, almost as controlling. Uh, yeah, um, it's, it's a strange thing, really. Um, it, the, you know, there were people at, at part of the court involved in the charity who were involved in a system that was controlling people. And they were black. A lot of them seemed blind to it. But but then they were working with people who had been controlled. controlled. Um, in, in my opinion, uh, you know, I, well, in that situation, I think it's really sad because I, I believe a big part of the reason why they were doing that work is because it's, um, you know, w- working with, tra- with people who've been trafficked is um, a really uh, u- important work. It brings a lot of um, respect from people. And I, I think that the group was riding on the back of that kind of uh, the prestige. I don't know if that's the right word that comes with working with people who've been trafficked you know it makes the cult look good it makes the leaders look good you know uh, look at all this great work we're doing when it when it when it when in in the 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 reality of what was going on behind the scenes was there were lots of people who did work really hard for the charity but in my in my opinion the it wasn't run very professionally and um the the i had concerns about where money was being spent when i was there um because there didn't seem to be much of it around and i seem to be getting paid much much lower than other charities that were under the same kind of contract Do you think they were aware of this this irony that we just spoke of no <laughs> i don't i don't think <laughs> they were aware at all um i i mean, it's quite interesting really because there's so much overlap between cults and human trafficking anyway um and the more extreme ones are basically keeping keeping people as slaves but um, I don't. I don't think they saw it. Um, the, the 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 ideology of the group was was so. It's delivered in such an excited, positive way, and the, you know, they worship the leaders so much that I don't. I just think they were caught up in it, and I just don't think they saw. You know, the, they they just didn't see the problem with telling someone that they weren't supposed to be in a relationship or telling someone. You know, they're, um, they're not allowed to contact or speak to someone. It just seemed, it was it was like two separate worlds almost, but yeah. And also you have written in a written a blog post on mm-hmm. autism in cults, yeah. and we're going to leave a link to that in the description below. And uh, all that's left to say is, Richard Turner, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.